Back in June of 1992, Michael Jordan was at the height of his powers, having led the Chicago Bulls to their first title the year before, and a couple of months from leading the first dream team to Olympic glory. Going up against one of the only shooting guards in his league in Clyde Drexler, this 92 NBA Finals promised to be a marquee matchup of two superstars. We've all seen the iconic image of the shrug, and most people are aware that it was related to Jordan's rare display of long-distance shooting. But what really happened in Game 1? How did we get to the point where the Bulls led by as many as 37 points? And who was the true catalyst that propelled the Bulls to their second of three straight titles? But let's focus on the main matchup of Drexler versus Jordan. If you didn't know, Clyde Drexler was drafted the year before MJ and was one of the best athletes in the NBA. He had power and grace and good touch around the basket. As you can see in transition early, Scottie Pippen had no chance to stop this in time and his attempted charge gets called a block, even though this angle makes it look like he got to his position before Drexler got up in the air. Both these teams were long and athletic and liked to pressure in the backcourt. Here, the Blazers line up in a 2-1-2 full-court press, wanting to make it hard on John Paxson. However, the wisdom of pulling your defense out like this and allowing Michael Jordan a free catch in the middle of the floor is all sorts of confounding, and his gravity sucks all the focus in before hitting Scotty for the nice dime and dunk. Portland's base offense was floppy, with lots of pin-down screens on either side of the floor. They try and catch Jordan out of position with the skip pass. He recovers well and goes for the swipe. Drexler gets the shot off clean. It's a line drive, but right in the hoop. Now, this game is noted for the three-pointers Jordan hit, but he didn't start out hot. In transition, Scotty pulls Jerome Kersey to him. Terry Porter needs to stop the ball, again leaving Michael Jordan, of all people, with a wide-open catch in all the space in the world, but he can't hit this one. The Bulls were running the triangle offense full-time at this point, but it wasn't the ballet that we come to see in 1996. No spacing on the weak side, but who needs it when you can rise up off one foot, float across the lane five feet to get open airspace, and swish this perfect-looking jumper after releasing on the way down. When they can't get Paxson coming off a double pin down on the weak side, Jordan again drives middle on Drexler, four defenders are in the lane, Pittman's man has to help, and the ball bounces long and eventually to Drexler, who is always most dangerous in these situations. Full head of steam, right hand dribble, taking off from the dotted line, one handed gather, and easy dunk past two guys, including MJ. You might think we're at the point now where Jordan starts nailing threes, right? While he did finish the game 6 for 10, he misses another wide open three when the defense clearly is begging him to shoot him. And I don't blame them. Shooting threes that year was simply something Michael Jordan didn't do. But we got an MJ three-point sighting on this possession, as you can see the Ben Simmons sag in full effect. Jordan's slightly unsure where to go, knowing he's going to get so much room once he catches it. And when it's reversed, he's instantly checking Scott Williams down in the post. But with six feet of space, he lets it fly, and this missile drops clean through the net. This got his rhythm going. One thing the triangle offense did for Jordan was got him attacking from all different spots on the floor organically. He fills the low post spot, the corner and wing cut through to give him space, and Drexler foolishly reaches in and whacks him on the arm as he fades away into a little 12-footer for the and one. More floppy from the Blazers as they run Drexler off the pin down from Mark Bryant. He settles for this hanging, kicking legs out jumper but catches MJ not boxing out and gets the nice assist to Cliff Robinson for the cram shot. Here's the high post series of the triangle where they get a UCLA cut from BJ Armstrong, then an inside ball screen for Pippen. Finally, we get some modern spacing. When they don't generate an attack with the same sag on Michael as we've seen the whole game, they get Scotty attacking from out top with little time left on the shot clock. Unclear what Drexler was doing here with his slide, but it's help one pass away off the corner from a guy who had just nailed the three, and MJ lights it up again with a practice shot in front of the Bulls bench. When Robinson doesn't like this wide open 15-footer, he inexplicably fires a pass to Bryant who isn't anywhere near open, 
It does find Drexler and another example of what type of physicality was permitted back then. And when the loose balls corralled, the Bulls are off to the races. There's no one to pick up Michael, who, in a very modern way, runs right to the wing for another lick my thumb and check the wind I'm so wide open three-point bomb. Jordan then flashes to the elbow, but Drexler is right there to strip him of the ball nicely. However, Jordan never stops moving, and now Drexler has to honor the shot fake from three. That's a serious blow-by. Check the hop into the shot. Also, the nice turn to achieve proper alignment for the shooting hip and elbow, and another jumper as the Bulls close the gap. Michael sits on Drexler's right hand since the scouting report says he can't go left. Check the nice stutter step crossover that gets him by Jordan, and back then, there was no restricted area. You could take charges anywhere in the lane. While Clyde was pissed about this, you can see that Williams does get there in time, is in legal guarding position, and it's a turnover. Here's another example of the triangle offense helping Jordan move to find lethal openings. He starts on the wing, then shuffle cuts to the low block. Again, he gets some treatment from the refs as he first wiggles that pivot foot a little bit, then lifts it up before the ball leaves his hand. An obvious travel, but he finds Horace Grant open for the assist. Locked in a tight game midway through the second, Jordan again goes down low to combat the huge sag they were giving him on the perimeter. Here's some of the good footwork, with the dream shake into a turnaround. Clyde even got a hand clean on the ball, but no matter. On this type of shimmy, he's supposed to land on both feet at the same time. He doesn't, so his right foot is the pivot, and it lifts and gets put back down. This is another travel the refs missed, but they must have given him the benefit of the doubt because it was close. This was the beginning of a run for the Bulls, as this time they dared Drexler to shoot a wide open three, and though Portland stops the initial fast break attack, you're not going to believe that no one picks up Michael Jordan till it's too late. Maybe Ainge is happy to give him this shot, but after he'd already hit a couple, this is like target practice. The crowd is riled up, and head coach Rick Adelman is forced to call timeout to stem the tide. Out of the timeout, Adelman decided to isolate Drexler down low in the post against Jordan, which is an interesting choice. Drexler loses his footing with the left step. Jordan steps in and steals it. Ains tries to take the foul at half court to stop the break, but too late. MJ's at his familiar Bulls logo on the right wing for his patented pull-up from 15. This game could get out of hand quickly, so they want to go down to Duckworth in the post. But Danny Ainge attacks the mismatch to the baseline and makes a nice pass to the cutting Drexler. But check the footwork. He tries to sidestep off both feet, doesn't get any lift, and has to double pump to fling this wildly off the glass. This game was still close. The Bulls only up seven, but Drexler foolishly gambles for this deal, and it directly leads to another Jordan pull-up to push the lead to nine. And here was the beginning of the end for Portland. When the Bulls can't find Jordan down low in the left block, the ball gets reversed to the baseline for a little Pippin no-rhythm jumper. A long rebound goes to Grant, who kicks it back out, and Jerome Kersey falls asleep on Michael as he just steps in for his fifth three-pointer and an NBA Finals record for threes and a half, plus 30 points total. If you're wondering where ice defense first started, here's a good indication as Jordan forces Drexler away from the inside ball screen while Cartwright drops down to contain. Pippen's really long arms steal the pass, and while he can't hit the off-foot lefty layup at full speed, Michael trails for the easy tip slam for a 14-point lead, and the crowd is going wild. At this point, it looks to me like Clyde Drexler panics, hoisting up a contested off-the-dribble three early in the shot clock. It's either blocked or just an awful attempt, and we all get what we've been waiting for. Mass confusion with the defense picking people up, and it directly leads to leaving the best player to have ever played the game wide open with no one on him. And when he hits this shot, he seems in awe of his own powers. But maybe he was also shrugging because he simply couldn't believe how wide open he'd been left all game long. One thing amazing about this moment is how genuine the reaction is. MJ wasn't forcing anything, wasn't trying to create his finals moment. He let the game come to him and was rewarded mightily. The third quarter got out of hand rather quickly, but it wasn't even Michael contributing that much. Scotty Pippen got into the act when they caught Kersey trailing off the jump ball, with Michael throwing a perfect looping pass in stride for the easy deuce. Turnovers killed the Blazers much more than MJ's threes, and when the Bulls were able to get two consecutive offensive rebounds in this possession before finding a complete mismatch with the slow-footed Kevin Duckworth out top on Scottie Pippen, 
This strong take to the hole plus the foul began to totally demoralize the Blazers. They then attacked another mismatch with Ainge, having no hope to stop this post up down low as Scotty just shot right over him. The Bulls' defense continued to swarm, made easier by the lack of spacing Portland's offense had, and after this Horace Grant block, a picture-perfect fast break with barely a bounce of the ball finds Scotty for another slam. Scotty continued his onslaught as the second wave of attack after the overwhelming production from Jordan, this time attacking the high hedge from Duckworth, bringing the ball high, waiting for the big to clear before crossing over into the lane for a tough floating flip for the friendly roll and one. Here's classic pinch post action out of the triangle. Now in the reverse, the triangle shapes up again, with Scotty now having room to attack the baseline and hit the jumper plus another shooting foul. Michael was not nearly as aggressive in the second half, getting four total points out of the offense, while Scotty did all the heavy lifting to completely end this game by the end of three quarters. In the end, it was clear to me that the six three-pointers Michael hit did have an effect on this game, especially the last two, which served as exclamation points on a big run. But it was also clear that this game was won on the defensive end, with the Doberman defense leading to 21 Blazers turnovers and Scottie Pippen scoring exploits in the third quarter to completely end this game early. The Bulls did go on to win this series in six hard-fought games, barely being able to handle what Portland was offering. And looking back 28 years later, it's clear that the shrug from Michael Jordan stood for a lot of different things. And it will serve to be one of the most iconic NBA Finals moments from someone with more of them than any other player ever. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to B-Ball Breakdown so you can get alerted right away when we drop a new video. This season will be filled with incredible content, so don't miss it. You in?